Thank you, thank you very much, Fabio, and welcome everyone uh, to our international technical webinar. Today we will be talking about climate change and agriculture, and more specifically on quantifying carbon stocks in soils and their evolution. Um, we this this webinar is part of a series of webinars and a, a, a very rich agenda that we have prepared for you for 2021. These webinars are organized by four organizations. So we have with us uh, Future, Food, uh, Future Food Institute. We have Agrinium. We also work with the UN uh, Economic and Social um, Commission for Asia and Pacific and FAO. So we are four uh, organizations which organize these webinars, but we work uh, throughout the world with over four, uh, 40 uh, partners who help us also in the promotion and also by providing experts and professors that contribute to these webinars. Um, we are extremely pleased to have with us today two experts on, on, uh, on uh, carbon uh, sequestration and carbon stocks. So uh, I have the pleasure to have with us today my colleague um, Martial Bernou, who is uh, a senior uh, natural resource officer in, in FAO and also uh, Valentin Belassen, who is a senior researcher in uh, environmental economics at INRAE, which is a French uh, institution. Um, before giving them the I just wanted to let you know that these, the technical areas that we cover in our webinars are all um, described in detail in the courses of the FAO eLearning Academy. So I'd like to invite you all whenever you ca can to visit the FAO eLearning Academy and to visit uh, the, the, the courses that are relevant to, to your work. And we also have a, a number of courses related to the thematic area of today's webinar. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Martial Bernou. So Martial, the floor is yours. You have about 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I will try to be even shorter to save a little bit of time for this discussion. So I will start sharing my screen. I will stop my camera, but I will reopen after. So, okay, you can still listen to me. Um, no, you should be able to see my full screen. Yes. Yes, everything okay, yes. Okay, so it's a really a pleasure to be here. And I was uh, looking at the list of participants. It's uh, really nice to see uh, a lot of uh, colleagues, former colleagues, friends over the world from uh, North uh, America, Latin America, Asia, Africa. So it's really nice to have all of you today. Uh, I, I have a double hat today. Uh, the first hat will be to present uh, the MOOC. So a uh, massive uh, open uh, online course on behalf of all the members of the MOOC coordinating team. So you have some names here, but a lot of uh, scientists, uh, soil scientists, uh, researchers, academic were also uh, involved in the construction of, uh, of that MOOC. So basically let's move here. So that MOOC is in French but with a subtitle on translation interpretation in uh, subtitle interpretation in English, it's related to all issues, processes, strategies to protect or increase soil carbon stock, but in relation to the climate agenda. And rather to having a, a lot of uh, slides, I prefer to present a teaser of that MOOC. So it's in French, but with English subtitle. Les activités humaines émettent beaucoup de CO2 dans l'atmosphère, renforcent l'effet de serre et accélèrent le changement climatique. Chaque année, 30% de ce CO2 est récupéré par les plantes grâce à la photosynthèse. Ensuite, lorsque ces plantes meurent et se décomposent, elles deviennent de la matière organique. Cette matière organique, riche en carbone, est essentielle à la fertilité des sols et plus généralement à l'ensemble des services écosystémiques fournis par les sols. L'augmentation de la quantité de carbone dans les sols contribuerait donc non seulement à stabiliser le climat, mais également à assurer un fonctionnement optimal des sols. Mais si l'agriculture et la forêt jouent de grands rôles sur le changement climatique, 
Stocker davantage de carbone dans les sols devrait effectivement améliorer à la fois le climat et la fertilité des sols. Ça a l'air très simple. Stockons du carbone dans les sols. Mais attends, j'ai quelques questions. Est-ce vraiment bénéfique Comment ça marche Comment être sûr qu'on en stocke Quelles sont les difficultés et les stratégies qui existent Et quels seront les principaux bénéficiaires de ce stockage Où trouver les réponses à ces nombreuses questions Dans le MOOC « Sol et climat », au cours de ces six semaines, vous découvrirez l'ensemble des enjeux des processus biophysiques, mais aussi techniques et socio-économiques de la dynamique du carbone dans les sols. Ok, so uh, you really got a really uh, short uh, snapshot in one minute and a half. Here you have the how it is organized in terms of logistics. So if you want to follow the, the that MOOC, it's six weeks of your time, and you need more or less two hours to three hours per week. It's open to all level. Basically, you don't need to have any background. Uh, It's really accessible to a large number of, uh, of people. Uh, the first session, you have the date on, uh, on the, the screen, so starting uh, soon uh, in May and ending in 20 of June. And also, you will have the opportunity to have a certificate of uh, achievement if you pass uh, 60% of uh, the question. Basically, Uh, that was the presentation of, of the MOOC, so I really invite you to go to the web page, so you will have the, the link on the chat, you will have the presentation with the link. Uh, you can see that it has been uh, done under the coordination of AgroParisTech, and it's uh, part of an ag Agrinium series in collaboration with a lot of partners. And you have here all the different uh, organizations that was uh, somehow involved in, in the creation of uh, that MOOC. So it was. It is over for, for that part. Now I, I will change my hat, and I, I will move to more technical content. And, and what I will present is also some old part of that MOOC. But in the MOOC, it's much more diluted and much more in detail. Here, it will be really a, a brief overview on tool and method for quantifying soil carbon stock in a climate change context. So I, I started and I, I will uh, use those three questions to uh, during my presentation. Why soil carbon stock are important for climate change? Really brief, because I guess most of you know why. Are the soil considered by the UNFCCC, so the, the highest political or policy level binding countries uh, related to the climate change agenda? And do we have tools and methods for quantifying soil carbon stock and providing so some link of, uh, to some tools? So the first question, it's quite easy. Here you have a, a really simplified representation of, uh, of an ecosystem where you have uh, atmosphere, plant, uh, living uh, biomass and soil. You have also animals you cannot see uh, hidden in the, in the middle. But basically, we have a big mechanism that is called the photosynthesis that is free, that capture uh, more or less one every seven to eight molecules of CO2 per year and put this into uh, biomass. Then part of that biomass can be transformed into organic matter. And why it is important to have uh, more soil carbon stock because if we also lose them, we will re-inject CO2. So here we have two levels of action, I would say. We, we can sink. So it was uh, really the, uh, the arrow uh, going downward. And we should avoid to uh, having a mismanagement of soil that would inject more CO2 into the atmosphere. And why it is good for climate change, so the answer is quite uh, straightforward. The less in terms of CO2, the better. So we are uh, trying on all countries, all uh, stakeholders are trying to, to fight against increasing uh, or limit, limiting the increase of CO2 or even sinking CO2. And the more organic matter we have, I'm mentioning organic matter, not only soil, carbon, but soil organic matter, the more we have, the better, because it's also uh, increasing uh, 
fertility of soil, fighting against erosion, stability of the soil. So it's providing, uh, you have here uh, an illustration, it's linked with a lot of uh, ecosystem uh, services, food regulation, water quality. So the more soil organic matter we have, the better. So it's a win-win and even more than that uh, solution. Now, trying to answer to the second question, are the soil considered in, in the highest uh, policy level? Here, three elements of answer. First, we have method responding to requests to the UNFCCC in terms of communicating what is happening in the different country in terms of greenhouse gas emission. And soil is fully considered. So we know, we, we, we have the knowledge about the level of uh, greenhouse gas emission from the soil category. We have the possibility to, to have it at different level. This, um, those methodology exist since uh, long now. They have been uh, recently refined in 2019 to ensure the best or the most updated science is, uh, is reflected in the methodology. On some table, you can see here, it's not for you to read, but uh, we have a default emission, a default value, different uh, reference value for carbon stock in a different soil uh, of the world for different uh, climate. The IPCC is also providing a simplified uh, methodology in terms of uh, modeling at a tier two level. So you have different level that are named tier by IPCC. So basically, we have a lot of reference values, scaling factor for management, for input, simplified modeling approach that can support the reporting for the UNF C. And soon we will see that later in the Paris Agreement. So it was the first level of answer. And here, just to remember that in the FAO eLearning Academy, you have uh, some uh, online course uh, uh, where you can uh, learn how to prepare greenhouse gas inventory under the new enhanced transparency framework that is part of the Paris Agreement and also in the uh, national greenhouse gas inventory for agriculture uh, and other land use. So please visit the Learning Academy. Uh, another uh, element of answer. We were looking at, so uh, the UNFCCC, you have, everyone knows that uh, five years ago was adopted the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is based on what we call NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, that is basically a goal target uh, from countries uh, expressing what they can do uh, to fight, uh, so it's mean to mitigate, but also to adapt to climate change. Uh, those instruments are policy instruments uh, determined at the national level. On the uh, TFO, we have a uh, build, uh, on, we are regularly updating a database of all published NDC. On, it was uh, all pleasure and it was really nice to see that almost half of all NDC already reference soil in a direct or indirect manner in both mitigation or adaptation priority. And you can see uh, on the side that most it is in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia Pacific in terms of number of uh, measures with more or less tight tie in terms of uh, adaptation mitigation, a little bit more in terms of adaptation, uh, which is normal because uh, in, uh, adaptation is only in the NDC of uh, developing countries. Uh, the focus is on agricultural soil in general, wetland and organic soil, so hotspot where you have a lot of uh, soil organic carbon, and with a predominant focus uh, relatively on adaptation. Uh, in terms of adaptation effort, you can see that it's mostly on the conserving, uh, so, so it means fighting the loss of carbon, uh, restoration and rehabilitating uh, agricultural soil, so increasing soil carbon stock. On, uh, on uh, mitigation effort, you, you can see here uh, enhancing soil organic carbon in natural unmanaged uh, landscape, including wetland and organic soil. And here you have uh, the different uh, measures. Uh, we have a website at FAO. If you look for in Google, FAO Climate Change and NDC, 
you will find all the different uh, method publication and review at regional level we, we did. And we can share the link after. And third element uh, on the UNFCC, uh, soil is also one of the topics discussed under the Cornelia joint work on agriculture. So it was a COP decision at COP23 uh, under the Fijian presidency to have a joint work dedicated to agriculture. It's quite uh, unique in uh, UNFCC C arena, which is basically not, uh, I would not say allergic to sectoral approach, but nearly. So it was really uh, encouraging for soil scientists, at least, and other people working on agriculture, to see that there is a dedicated agenda, both under the two bodies. This is why joint work. So under the implementation body, and under the scientific and technical advice body of the, of the convention. And you can see it's, uh, the decision is quite sh uh, short, but sharp, with different topics. And one is a, a topic known as 2C, on the improved soil carbon, soil health, on soil fertility, on the grassland and cropland. So this is agriculture in the sense of UNFCC, known in the sense of FAO that is uh, wider encompassing also aquaculture, forestry, and fishery. On what we have under that agenda, parties, so countries, and observers already provided their views in terms of uh, all the topics. So you can see here to be, but uh, the two C that is interested, interesting for us. Uh, so the views of the country, what we should do in terms of soil, where the caution should be, where we need more science, and etc. So we have a publication published by FAO where we, we did uh, just a factual uh, uh, analysis of the different submissions. Then uh, the Secretariat organized already a meeting to discuss the soil topic on the UNFCCC. And have uh, so uh, a report uh, that is a, a summary of the different discussion on, on the UNFCCC website. You can find the different presentation that was done. One was from uh, an opening from Claire Chenu, another one from Ronald Vargas, people uh, well known in the uh, soil community, and with also exchange after uh, with the different countries. On FAO, also draft a, a brief, a two page summary on what uh, we can have in terms of uh, recommendation for policy makers. I'm just uh, trying to summarize really those complex discussion. We can see that the narrative is evolving from a soil carbon sequestration pure angle to a more healthy soil that encompass also adaptation. So not only on the mitigation side, uh, the Coronivia should conclude uh, at next COP, so in, in Glasgow this year, normally, on a lot of uh, stakeholders are hoping a clear signal supporting more investment for LC soil, for GCF, GEF, and other multilateral bank or development agency. And this, if this happens, it will uh, also request more research modality, pilot phase, scaling up on action for LC soil. And then at the end, it will support not only the having soil in the NDC, but having action uh, to implement the NDC on the ground that would uh, fully consider uh, soil. Now, if I move to the, the last question, do we have tools and methods? And first, we need to consider different scale because we need, depending to the uh, stakeholder, interested people, so field plot and farm, mostly that would be the most, uh, the, the scale where farmers, landowners uh, will uh, look at. Uh, national and subnational level where policymakers will, uh, during low regulation, will also look at NDCs at that level. And we can have also for private, more private sector, voluntary market, the project level. And basically, if you two, scientific publication, and there is much more, but uh, those are quite uh, good review. And we have the standards, with, uh, you can see a, a lot of colleagues. On uh, another is uh, how to measure, uh, uh, report, and verify MRV system. And you can see in one 
figure here a lot of different approaches uh, where we have a lot of uh, tools, method, uh, model, and uh, validated scientifically. So basically, research is saying we have a lot. If uh, you look also FAO, as uh, recently in September 2020, uh, under the umbrella of the Global Soil Partnership and with uh, its Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soil, developed a protocol for MRV, so measurement monitoring, so the M reporting are uh, landscape level for sustainable soil management practices at farm level, but can be easily scaled up at a different scale. And this is part of a global soil partnership GSP carbon toolkit. I will not detail here, but go on their uh, website and you can find that they're working on the five pillars you can see uh, on the bottom here, soil management, uh, awareness, research, information, data, and harmonization. They have developed a lot of uh, relevant information uh, as a scientific level, technical level, or as a targeting a policy maker. So please have a look. And um, if we look at the project level, here I'm just selecting one publication, perhaps a little bit uh, older than the other, but still valid. Uh, you have different tools. You have uh, nowadays more than 25 to 30 different tools that you can. One has been developed by FAO, uh, Exact Tool. You can see on the, the box here that there is also an FAO e-learning academy uh, e-learning uh, available on how to use uh, Exact. And you have uh, here the link of the Exact website. Uh, but look at the picture in the, in the middle. Uh, and this is uh, here the conclusion that is also in a, that other publication that is more recent from the World Bank greenhouse gas accounting for sustainable land management, that most of those tools are based on IPCC guidelines. So the guidelines that are so recognized for national greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, they are using default values, but result might change according to the completeness and scope of the tool, or they have embedded the methodology. And you can see in the picture also in the middle of the screen, certain tools account for biomass land use change, account for soil land use change over a 20 year period, other not. So basically you, you will have to select the tool that fits your own need according to your, your proper objective. But I would encourage you to, to move toward a more complete tool than a more simple and incomplete tool. And at national level, uh, just for you to be aware, FAO is developing a NDC expert tool where we will target here the, the really precisely the policy at national level, based again on IPCC as all the tools already existing, but really targeting national commitment with here you can see the entry level will be uh, the country. So we'll have to select first the country because it's NDC, and then you will have at your disposition all the different climate, soil, agricultural zone, crop, livestock, corresponding to that country, and where you can play with different kinds of uh, calculation and having results on an annual basis. Uh, so it will allow you to, to see how NDC can be improved and enhanced because the uh, NDC process has to be reviewed every five years in, a, in a, uh, enhancing the ambition. And it can be also helpful to track and monitor greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction. So it was really a, a snapshot. And if I really go back to my three questions, here you have two big yes. Uh, the first one is uh, it's really a big consensus. The last one, it's sometimes people are saying that we do not have tools and they are saying we should improve. Yes, we can always improve, but we already have enough to start. What is missing? This is a second question. Yes, soil is under the UNF triple C. Still depend of a strong political uh, signal, and we hope that signal will be given by Cornivia to show that uh, investment should be uh, should target uh, soil, healthy soil, uh, 
on this will be really useful for the support country in their mitigation goal and also adaptation needs. Um, I really want to thank you for the patience to having me for two, two presentations, one after the other. Um, really thank you to a lot of you. I will stop sharing my screen. So on Christina, it's over to you for the Thank next you. Thank you, Martial. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And uh, we certainly understand a little bit better about the importance and the role of soils in reducing uh, the impact of, of climate change. I would like to ask you, Martial, uh, while uh, Valentin uh, presents, if you could have a look at the questions that have been asked to you. Uh, on both on the Q&A and chat, because after Valentin's presentation, uh, we will be opening a Q&A session where you will be having the opportunity to respond to some of these questions. Thank you very much. Valentin, the floor is yours. You have uh, 20 to 30 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thanks, Christina. Um, hello to everyone, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, I'll open the video only after because um, uh, I, I prefer to, uh, to make it safe in terms of uh, connectivity. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so thanks everyone from seeing here. I've seen a lot of uh, names from, from colleagues or former colleagues, some I haven't seen for a long time. So hi, hi there. Um, the purpose of uh, my presentation is, uh, is actually to, um, to, to show you one of the the sequences of the of this MOOC, rather on the uh, economics uh, and policy side, um, and of course it's a bit synthesized compared to the material that's in the MOOC. Um, the the purpose of this sequence uh, is uh, is actually to uh, to question the choice between the different approaches to monetary soil carbon that uh, that Martial has uh, outlined. So <clears throat> let's um, uh, let's start by uh, taking the example of a regulator who wishes to remunerate farmers who store carbon in their soils. Uh, intuitively, the regulator faces two major constraints in monitoring storage. One is the cost of monitoring, which should not be too high. And the other is the accuracy of monitoring, which must be high enough to allocate payments efficiently. And the objective of, the, of, the, of, of this sequence is to go beyond the intuitive trade-off between cost and accuracy of monitoring by understanding how to design effective monitoring procedures. But let's start with three important definitions and three common misconceptions about carbon storage monitoring and uncertainty. Uh, first is accuracy and precision. A method is said to be accurate if the average of the measurements is close to the true value. It can also be said then to be unbiased. And this is different from precision. A method is said to be precise if the standard deviation of the measurements is low. Therefore, we can have methods that are accurate but not precise, some methods that are precise but biased, and some methods that are both accurate and precise. The second important definition in the context of policymaking is information asymmetry. So we say that there is information asymmetry between a regulator and an agent like a project developer, if the agent has privileged information that is unknown to the regulator. This is the case, for example, with crop yields when they are used as a parameter in a carbon storage model. Uh, the regulator may have, of course, an idea of the average yield in a given region, but the farmer or the project developer may know the exact value for his plots. And finally, but that's already been introduced by Marcial. The last important definition uh, is MRV, which refers to the set of procedures for obtaining a reliable estimate of carbon storage or emissions. M stands for monitoring, R for reporting, and V for verification. Now, let's, take, let's test your uh, preconceptions on three commonly held ideas. 
The first one is carbon storage. Uh, it's that carbon storage in biomass and the soils is the most uncertain part of greenhouse gas inventory. Well, this is partly wrong. Um, if I take the French inventory as an example, the uncertainty associated with uh, fertilizer use is around 180%, which is much higher than the 30% uncertainty associated with carbon storage. Of course, we should note that for the time being, all the most, um, most uh, carbon storage um, reported in greenhouse gas inventories are associated with land use changes which of course limits the uncertainty. Uh, the second misconception is that measurement uncertainty is an obstacle to carbon pricing. This argument has been put forward by the European Commission, for example, for not implementing a carbon pricing system for the land sector. And as I will show you, um, this again is rather false. Um, as I will show, um, especially in the case of information asymmetry, then uncertainty may not be a large obstacle. And finally, uh, the third preconceived idea is that when a measure is uncertain, it is better to be conservative and to under reward carbon storage. Here again, we shall see that this is only a good idea in cases where the agent has privileged information. So where there is information asymmetry. Um, now, Let's turn to a decision tree intended to pol policymakers on how to design uh, rules uh, for monitoring carbon. Um, typically, uh, policymakers uh, use three types of rules uh, in, uh, in their systems, and they sometimes coexist. The first is prescription. So the regulator, regulator prescribes uh, the entire procedure for monitoring soil carbon and therefore prescribes the level of uncertainty. Uh, the second one is threshold. Uh, there, the, the regulator prescribes a maximum uncertainty threshold and lets the agents choose a method that is, that, that is below this threshold. So that results in an uncertainty that is below uh, the prescribed threshold. And finally, um, the third type is the discount. Uh, the regulator then lets agents choose a method, but totally freely, but discounts uh, the storage payment in proportion to the uncertainty result resulted from the method. Um, and now uh, I, I will skip uh, the detailed demonstration of, of, uh, of how we built this, uh, this decision tree. You can find this in the MOOC to go to uh, the results. So the first question that the policymaker should ask is, is there information asymmetry? If not, then there is no strong need to regulate the accuracy of monitoring. Uh, if yes, then the second question that should be asked is, can agents manipulate monitoring? Um, if they can, then a fixed discount should be applied to the results um, of the MRV procedure. Uh, if they cannot, then uh, the next question is, that is the profitability of, um, um, it, is the participation um, to the carbon pricing, pricing mechanism uh, mandatory? Um, if it is, um, and if, the project profitability is close to zero, then the best solution to maximize welfare is to apply a discount that is proportional to the, the uncertainty that results from, um, from, the, um, uh, from the monitoring method. Um, if not, uh, then we should ask another question. Does the regulator have a reasonable idea of, um, of abatement costs. Um, if yes, then he, should, uh, he can prescribe um, um, the entire method and thereby the uncertainty. Uh, if not, however, uh, then the proportional discount again is the safest option. 
to conclude on this decision tree, let's note that it responds to an objective of maximizing total well-being. And of course, this objective may be a little simplistic. For example, uh, it neglects the fact that some agents may be greatly overpaid in relation to the effort they make. Uh, if the regulator has other objectives, such as limiting undue payments or limiting the unit cost of mitigation, then the interest of precision is reinforced even in the absence of information asymmetry. So to conclude uh, on this first part, uh, in terms of the design of monitoring rules, it is worth noting that first, uh, uncertainty is not a problem in itself. First, the land sector is not the most uncertain sector. And second, and more importantly, the lack of precision does not undermine the economic efficiency of a carbon pricing mechanism. Uh, secondly, measurement bias and information asymmetry are the main problems. They cause selection bias and willful effects that reduce the effectiveness of carbon pricing mechanisms. And thirdly, and I've not presented that in much detail today, uh, the economic literature offers a range of solutions to these problems, to information asymmetry. Um, of course, there is one option is to reduce uh, uncertainty. This uh, we have discussed to some extent. But other possibilities include offering a menu of contracts, for example, via top-down auctions to induce agents to reveal their so-called type. Um, contracts combine a quantity of emission reductions and a unit price. And by forcing agents to choose between either a high unit price associated with a small quantity or a low unit price associated with a larger quantity, one forces agents to reveal, reveal whether it is easy for them to reduce emissions and thus limit windfall effects. Uh, alternatively, the regulator can use a baseline scenario, which is more demanding than the average performance of agents. And finally, the regulator can force each agent to enroll large REAs. So that way, that, that's it for the kind of theoretical uh, and general part of this sequence. And now let's turn to what uh, regulator of the main existing carbon pricing mechanism as, are asking um, in terms of uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification rules in practice. Um, this sequence draws heavily on the results of the MRV sector project, which were published in a book, Accounting for Carbon, and summarized in a 2015 paper in Nature Climate Change. Um, for this work, uh, a broad definition of the term pricing system was adopted. We have studied systems that directly put a price on carbon, such as taxes or carbon markets, but also carbon management systems that rely more on transparency, such as the Climate Convention or the Grenell II laws in France. Um, we've studied 15 carbon pricing systems uh, for this overview, and they are classified into uh, three categories. So the first category is the jurisdictional scale. That is the emissions management systems of a territory. The main example is the national greenhouse gas inventories under the United Conventions that Marshall have mentioned. Uh, but we have also covered territorial inventories and national or regional scale red plus programs. The second category is the scale of the industrial facility or company. The main example is the Europe, European Carbon Market, or EU ETS, but we have also covered similar schemes in other geographical areas, as well as company-wide carbon management schemes. And finally, the third category is the scale of the project, often carbon offsetting. The main example in this category is the Clean Development Mechanism, or CDM, but we have also looked at, at several types of projects governed by different public or private standards. Uh, we've done and, and we've drawn six uh, main conclusions. The first is that monitoring costs decrease sharply with the size of the perimeter where emission or storage are measured. Um, this can be seen on this graph, which plots the costs of monitoring per ton of CO2 as a function of size. These, uh, you can see there are large economies of scales 
And, and these uh, are caused by the large share of fixed cost in MRV costs. Indeed, when you monitor an emission reduction projects, for example, you have to write a project document and monitoring reports. And these documents, they are roughly the same length, regardless of the size of the project. Um, yet most uh, pricing system applies the principle of materiality. Materiality means concentra concentrating resources on monitoring the largest sources of emissions. In other words, it, it means being more demanding for large projects than for small ones. But clearly, as you can see with the economies of scales on this graph, uh, the, the materiality principle is less effective than, than the economies of scales and, uh, and the fixed costs. Finally, um, it should be noted that for a comparable quantity of emissions, uh, the cost of emission is lower at the scale of industrial sites than for the scale of carbon offset projects here in green. Uh, and it makes sense. Uh, the participation of agents is voluntary in carbon offsetting, so you can be more demanding, whereas it is mandatory in carbon uh, in cap and trace system. Um, the second conclusion we drew is still related to costs. It can be seen that for the same type of offset projects, uh, the monitoring cost can vary by a factor of one to three, depending on the standard chosen to certify storage. And of course, this is probably not unrelated to the quality of monitoring demanded by each standard. Thirdly, it appears that the vast majority of systems require verification of or audit by an independent third party. This brings credibility, of course, but it is also a major cost driver. Uh, for offset projects, verification represents about a third of um, of total MRV costs. And uh, the verifier is, as we have seen, an independent third party. So this cost cannot be internalized. As a result, the cost of verification falls more heavily on smaller organizations. This can be shown in this bar chart from a survey of Irish sites that participate to the European carbon market. The fifth observation is that the incentive to reduce uncertainty within the rules is weak. Measurement uncertainty is rarely rewarded by monitoring rules. And when it is rewarded, it is in an indirect or limited way, such as respecting a maximum uncertainty threshold, as I mentioned in the general part. Uh, and finally, we have studied a commonplace which is usually taken for granted, namely the so-called conservatism of estimates. Um, this commonplace, which we could also call the precautionary principle, uh, should result in overestimating emissions or underestimating storage when monitoring is uncertain. In practice, um, this is almost never the case at the jurisdictional scale. Uh, nor is it the case at the scale of industrial sites where participation in the pricing system is often mandatory. And there may be good reasons for this. Uh, conserv conservative estimates would increase the imbalance in monitoring costs between large and small sites, which, as we have already seen, is important. Uh, and finally, at the project level, the principle of conservatism does exist in the rules, but it is not applied systematically. For example, uh, in the clean development mechanism, this principle is only applied to some of the parameters or variables that are being monitored. And even in the most demanding monitoring methodologies, the proportion of variables to which a discount is applied in case of uncertainty uh, does never exceed 25%. So with this, you've had the overview. If you want more details on, of some of the aspects of this, this talk, I've put you here uh, uh, a short list of, of interesting references. And I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentin. 
Um, this was a very technical presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So while I give the floor to Martial uh, to respond to some of the questions uh, he had, I would like to ask you to have a look at the Q&A and also maybe the chat to see if there are specific questions to your presentations, because you will then have the chance to, uh, to respond. Thank you very much. So Martial, the floor is yours. Um, if you can answer some of the questions that, uh, that uh, were asked to you by, by participants. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So trying to tackle several questions. Uh, some I have already typed a short answer. On NDC, so there was a question what means NDC, so nationally determined contribution. In French, it's a contribution determinée au niveau national. Uh, this is a commitment that comes from countries, what they can do in terms of mitigation and adaptation uh, on this is under the umbrella of the Paris Agreement. And basically, this is uh, the, uh, what the country are putting on the table to reach the goal of two degrees C. Uh, and I provided also two links where you can find also some uh, the repository of all NDC. So your country has uh, an NDC, and also FAO is providing some analysis of some NDC. Uh, not, uh, not all in order. Related to the tools, some aspect free. Yes, most of the tools uh, are free. Uh, I would say 95% are free. So some uh, need uh, a registration for, just for the developer to follow who is using the tool and if there is some update to inform you. But the, most of them are free uh, simply because they are based on IPCC method that uh, it's a free and available uh, method also. Uh, the, there is a specific question on how to consider a deeper layer. In most of the tool, you, you have uh, what IPCC call default factor, tier one level, at first level, that it's uh, considered only the first uh, top 30 centimeter. But most of the tools allow you to put the number you have, either from scientific publication, from your own uh, analysis, and here you are not limited to 30 centimeter. So you, you can uh, use uh, more than that. Uh, and just uh, IPCC is saying that uh, you should consider more than 30 centimeter when your uh, management system is uh, impacting below 30 centimeter. So it's a, it's a need. Uh, then there was an, one question, a, a, a remark from a farmer. Uh, it was uh, that how to, to involve a farmer uh, the, on that. Uh, have you been in touch with any farmer? Uh, Yes, uh, different colleagues on FAO is working also on the ground with uh, sometimes with uh, other stakeholders, uh, civil society organization, uh, NGO, not only uh, with government and technical organization. So there is, a, for instance, a farmer field school. Uh, this is involving farmer on the ground. And for sure, we, we need to have a, an, an adequate uh, a level of presentation of the tool because the farmer do not want to most of the time to understand the science behind. He need to understand how to use the tool, what mean the different result of the tool, and what has implication for for him. But we are trying to involve the farmer because at the end this is the farmer that will uh, implement the different action on the ground. Uh, there is a very technical question on C thirteen so. Stable uh, isotope. Uh, this is mostly at research level, but uh, you, you can follow, for instance, where you have a moving for a vegetation that is called C3, like a forest, to a C4 vegetation like sugarcane or, or corn, for instance. You can follow the on split the organic matter in organic matter that is uh, with the origin from the forest biomass and the organic matter with the origin from the new uh, introduce, uh, for instance, uh, pasteur, sugarcane. So in specific situation, you can uh, follow on. This is useful to develop and uh, to validate models, for instance, that can be used more widely and more easily. 
because the C certain measurements are quite expensive and not so easy to, to do. Uh, so this is one uh, example. Uh, then there was an interesting question from, from Cassiano uh, de Souza uh, on more simple methods. So here vis visual, it's really difficult. It's really difficult and it will be really context specific because only the color of the soil can uh, hardly be related straightforwardly with uh, soil carbon stock. It is dependent of all the factors that influence uh, uh, the color. But just to be aware, you have not only the visible that is uh, useful, you have no apparatus that can also use uh, infrared or visible and near infrared. And here you have a uh, method with some calibration that can allow you to have some estimation on that can lower the cost of the estimation when you have uh, different or big areas or thousands of samples, for instance, to, to, to analyze. But uh, visual method on the ground, it's uh, really difficult. Um, I guess perhaps Valentin, if you want to take over for some question, and I will uh, go back later, just not to manipulate yeah, the talk. Maybe one of them, or, or two of them, which are related to uh, the role of farmers in all this. And I think it's, uh, it's important to realize that in practice, uh, it's not the farmers themselves most commonly that uh, uh, that either use the tools or um, or enroll um, or I mean or make the paperwork uh, of uh, of MRV um, in uh, in offset projects or other schemes it, it, and and it's probably more efficient uh, the way it works that that uh, there are some intermediaries between the regulator uh, who who grants uh, the common credits. Uh, or, or regulates the cap and trade system and the farmers uh, in the form of either project developers or interprofessional organizations. And, uh, and then, so in, in my work, I've been, I've been more involved with these inter intermediaries um, and in particular in the, in the design of the, of the label bas carbone which is uh, which is the offset standard that was uh, put in place two years ago in France, and uh, and that uh, that is beginning to uh, that that now has uh, several uh, validating methodologies that take into account the benefits from soil carbon sequestration. Um, so I guess I guess maybe to conclude on this point. Um, <clears throat> Uh, some bits that are in the MOOC may be uh, maybe too technical or useless uh, for uh, for at least some farmers, but uh, but uh, but certainly useful for uh, intermediaries that that uh, that are willing to um, uh, to actually uh, help farmers uh, in getting uh, benefits from soil carbon sequestration in existing schemes. Okay, Christina, if I can take other question? Yes, yes, please, please go ahead. Okay, so there, there is a the question with a lot of uh, like, six like from Francisco Xavier from Embrapa, Brazil. Uh, so it's a complex question because we have three questions in one. Uh, first, how to deal with soil carbon sequestration strategies? First, you will need a, a political will, and all the rest will follow. It does not mean that it will be easy, but you need, yes, for sure, science. Uh, your first question is limited capacity of the soil carbon storage. We know that most of uh, you have certainly uh, limited capacity, but a lot of soil are at a level that is really below their optimal capacity. So here we have a potential, and we have a billion of hectares of soil. So if we apply uh, some techniques that even have an increase of several just uh, hundred of kilo of carbon per hectare uh, per year, if we scale up that, it can have a big impact. And it's not only increasing, it's avoiding losing carbon. This is also, uh, I would say, as important as uh, increasing carbon. 
So we, here we can also have a policy on strategy to avoid losing, because better than to, to fix, it's better to avoid uh, creating the problem. So this is to the first one. On the fast decomposition of recently sequestered carbon, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of different fluxes and it's equilibrium. But basically, if we are able to implement a system where you have more input uh, through biomass, uh, than output, uh, basically we will have a, a, an increase, even if slowly, but we will have an increase. So you, you, you might increase fresh organic matter that will uh, decompose uh, faster, but uh, in total that uh, it's, uh, we should not look only at the short term, uh, short, uh, term uh, scale, but looking at a uh, long uh, duration. On uh, end content, yeah, uh, you need to produce biomass, to, to have cell, uh, and you need to, in biomass, you not only N, uh, but you need uh, uh, phosphorus, uh, other element. And so this is more, I would say, agronomic aspect. Uh, that has some implication. And so the more N, if you have the more carbon, probably the more N, and you have a risk of more N2 emission. So, uh, but there is a recent paper, I can share the link, that was looking if, uh, and to emission from any increase when you have more soil organic carbon can offset the benefit of uh, soil uh, carbon sequestration. And the answer was uh, in most of the case, no. So and it's still valuable to increase uh, soil organic matter as I explained for fertility, fighting erosion, for instance, it's not only uh, uh, climate concern. But uh, on that question, we would need a full day to discuss. Uh, there was a, a question easy to answer from uh, Remy Cardinal. Uh, so the next tool will be available uh, first prototype in June, June, July, so mid of this year. And we are already testing on trying to use uh, on supporting country, at, uh, yeah, mostly in Africa, uh, applying uh, that tool. And it's part of a toolbox, uh, not only that. Uh, we will provide more detailed answer uh, in writing. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a question from Gabon, if uh, there is some work on uh, equatorial uh, context. On, uh, related to another question that was uh, for all type of uh, agriculture uh, from Florence, do we have uh, quantification for all kinds of uh, cropland, arboriculture, uh, or, uh, orchards, and so on. Uh, yes, uh, you have method that you can uh, tailor to any different context. And we have research and uh, information available for, for tropical context, uh, all, all context, even if most of the research so far was uh, quantitatively done uh, for temperate uh, countries, we still have a lot of uh, research information for, for tropical uh, region. Uh, I guess the last question is for you, Valentin. The reason the cost of monitoring, I can probably. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can answer that. Um, so, um, so I think, uh, uh, how, how can you use soil carbon stock as a tool to increase carbon in Cameroon? Um, uh, I think the, 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 the first thing I would do would be to, to, to go, um, uh, to visit, uh, the website of uh, Vera, which is a carbon offset standard that applies, uh, worldwide and which has uh, several methodologies uh, that uh, allow to, to put it simply to, to transform soil carbon sequestration to uh, voluntary carbon credits and that so would be applicable in, in Cameroon. And, um, and, uh, and then of course the cost of monitoring, well, yeah, I guess it depends the, the methodology you select, but it's, it's difficult to answer quickly. So I think you would have to, to go there, browse through the methodologies and uh, and select the one that is most relevant to the activity uh, you're planning. And there was also 
another question for which I can offer a few elements from Tian Chang on the on the role that Afolu has been playing and can play in the commitments of, of countries to carbon neutrality. Uh, I guess a factual uh, answer that I have is that it varies. Uh, uh, in the French uh, carbon neutrality strategy, for example, Afolu really dominates, um, uh, I mean, after uh, reducing um, uh, fossil fuel emissions, of, of course, uh, then within the sequestration part of the strategy, Afolu clearly dominates. Uh, there is only, I think, 15% uh, of total removals that, that is uh, planned to be obtained from uh, more technical ways, such as uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, but the, at, at the EU level, um, uh, the share that is envisioned for CCS is, is much larger. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think I remember exactly the number, but I think it, it's between one third and half of uh, of of total uh, sequestration needed to achieve uh, carbon neutrality at EU level that uh, that is planned to be obtained through CCS. Okay. And all this you can find in the in the all this information detailed you can you can find in the in the strategies of of the relevant countries or or geographical groups such as the eu excellent thank you i don't know if there are other questions however i just wanted also to inform participants that um uh, in the in the fao e-learning academy there is a section dedicated to webinars where you can find um, uh, of course, the recording of this event. Uh, you can also find the presentations of the of the of, of the speakers, uh, as well as the the answers of all the questions uh, that participants have have asked to uh, to to the experts. So this is all available in the um, webinar section of the FAO e Learning Academy. And um, if uh, uh, Martial and Valentin, you have covered more or less everything, or you wanted to add something else? Just to add on several questions, and there was a question, I guess, from the North Africa context. Yes. Uh, I, I share, I tap at the answer a link of a book that has been published together by FAO and a network of French uh, scientific research center in Africa. It's uh, Carbon des Sols en Afrique, Impact des Usages des Sols et des Pratiques Agricoles. So it's uh, sort of carbon in Africa, it's in French. Uh, and you have an example of uh, uh, numbers on research results for Northern Africa, also Morocco. On, uh, I can see online, you have a lot of colleagues working from CIRAD on a French Research Institute for Development, IRD, that used to work in, in Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Algeria. So here you have uh, plenty of uh, information. Um, I see that Remy put on the chat the link with uh, the article with the SOC storage with the offset of N2O. And perhaps just to add, there was a question on effectiveness, effectiveness of hyperspectral imaging. So it has to be combined with other because here it's uh, just a uh, you will have to combine with other proxy, but it's interesting and to link with uh, what uh, Valentin was saying on Cameroon is depend of the scale and sometimes uh, remote sensing can be really helpful to lower the cost, at least in terms of uh, uh, having uh, some approaches in terms of splitting the land in different categories. Uh, it can be uh, per hectare basis a really uh, interesting uh, cost. So, because you can cover a hundred of uh, square kilometer. Uh, that's it on perhaps the last one on uh, livestock uh, from Arthur. Uh, do uh, some of the protocol take into consideration livestock? Uh, most of them, yes, uh, they are quite holistic. It's not only the soil component, it's all that is uh, above. Uh, on the management of the soil. So some of the tool is the exact tool on the next uh, fostering tool. You will have also livestock that is linked with also sometime manual production on uh, return uh, organic matter to the soil. Over, but we will, I guess, uh, Christina will respond also uh, in writing uh, most of the question providing links. Yes, also because what we're trying to do is, is to document these webinars 
because um, yes, we, we want to capitalize on, on this expertise and make it available then for everyone, uh, anyone at any time uh, through the through the the FAO e learning academy. So this is really. Uh, also the purpose of, of these webinars, not to, just to do a one-off, but also to gather statistics about our participants, about their interests also, uh, in order to better target uh, our, our program for, for the year. Uh, I wanted to, um, to just before we conclude, I wanted to also mention that when we talk about environment and sustainability, um, uh, there are a number uh, of courses that were mentioned just before that we have. Uh, so uh, in the FAO eLearning Academy, uh, all the courses have a common thread and the common thread is sustainability. So uh, uh, we had just before uh, listed a number of courses that are relevant to the webinar of today, among which courses on, on uh, soils, on soils uh, restoration, and also on how to estimate uh, carbon emissions and also on greenhouse. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Fabio. <laughs> on, um, on also, so I was mentioning, so some of the, these courses are highly relevant to the, to the thematic area of today and uh, especially the one on um, climate uh, smart soil and land management, but also sustainable land management and uh, land restoration. And also, of course, all the uh, national greenhouse uh, gas uh, inventory uh, courses on land use for agriculture, etc. So um, these are among the courses that we have selected for you, but we would like to invite you to go uh, for yourself and visit and, and uh, basically pick and choose the ones that are more relevant to your area of expertise and work. Uh, Fabio, maybe the next screen, please. Uh, I would like to, uh, before we conclude, I would like to uh, mention that FAO, together with, the, with our partner, um, Future Food Institute, we are organizing next week uh, to celebrate the 51st anniversary of uh, Food Earth. Uh, we, we are organizing a 24-hour global marathon for sustainability. And we are trying to uh, allow uh, to have a common space for everyone to share their experiences, their challenges, their also their, their good practices uh, related to sustainability. So we have involved indigenous people, farmers, uh, also policymakers, but also young entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, we are trying to gather, uh, to, to gather the, um, the experiences of all these different um, uh, stakeholders to share with us their experience on sustainability. So uh, if you can join us um, uh, for, for, for the marathon, uh, we will be sharing with you uh, the, the link of the 24 hour marathon uh, that will take place 22nd of April. I would like to conclude by thanking, uh, really by expressing my our appreciation for uh, our speakers. Thank you very much, Marcel and, and um, Valentin. Uh, I would like to thank also uh, the organizers, so Future Food Institute, UNS CAP, um, and Agrinium, of course, uh, for, for the organization. And special thanks to Fabio Picinit and uh, Philippe Prévost, who are behind the scenes supporting and helping. And special thanks, I would like to thank very much all our participants. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you and stay tuned because very soon we have another webinar for you on 12th of May. And uh, this time we will be talking about how to transition to nutrition sensitive, uh, sustainable food systems. Thank you all very much. And we look forward to having you with us uh, on the 12th of May. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>